Cherubs, this is one of Georgia O'Keeffe's widely known flower paintings. They're remarkably engaging pieces, with bright colors, curving dynamic lines, and a large scale. They're some of the most recognizable works ever produced on American soil, and the artist can immediately be identified. You can show this painting to pretty much anyone, and they'll know it's a Georgia O'Keeffe. They're also some of the most misunderstood paintings, if a painting can be misunderstood. I'm sure you've heard the comparison of these flowers to genitalia, but let's look at them a little bit more complexly. To do that, let's start with Georgia O'Keeffe, the human being. Her personality and individuality was central to her work as an artist, and I know we can say that about a lot of artists, but it's particularly true of her. Unlike other artists, she often sacrificed her career to maintain her independence. She had trouble living in the big cities, for example, but big cities are where people sell art. She preferred places like Santa Fe, New Mexico to New York City. The big empty expanses of land did more for her than the crowded spaces, but the connections and the money and the galleries were in those crowded spaces. The open spaces allowed her to clear her head and focus on the art of seeing the world. She needed the space to explore and improve the way that she looked and engaged with everything. Not only did she leave places like New York City to preserve that individual vision, even though it would have been good for her career, when she married one of the most famous men in the art world, Alfred Stieglitz, she did not adopt his name. She kept her individuality there as well, even if the new last name would have opened up more doors for her. And so what did she do with all of this independence? She explored the relationship of emotion to sense perception. One of her most important artistic insights is that the visual can invoke the emotional, and the reverse of that is also true, that our emotional state can impact the way that we see. She once wrote about a thought that she had while looking over the marsh during the night. In the darkness, it all looked just like I felt, wet and swampy and gloomy, very gloomy. The two-way relationship between our emotions and our sense perception is a theme that she consistently explored in her work. That idea drives her focus, making the physically small beauty of a flower large. These flowers can look how we feel, and we can feel the way that they look. Alright, that's too abstract. I apologize. It'll make more sense, I hope, if I put it in a historical context. These paintings began to appear in the 1920s. Technological advancement had been jump-started by the First World War. Skyscrapers were climbing higher. You know what? I'm just gonna let her words explain the connection. That was in the 20s, and everything was going so fast. Nobody had time to reflect. There was a cup and a saucer and a spoon and a flower. Well, the flower was perfectly beautiful. It was exquisite. But it was so small, you really could not appreciate it for itself. So then and there, I decided to paint that flower in all its beauty. If I could paint that flower in a huge scale, then you could not ignore its beauty. These paintings explore that experience of looking at something small in a way that it takes up your entire field of vision and becomes your entire experience, and your full focus before you look up, snap out of it, and realize that the entire universe still remarkably exists. The world could view the communication of this feeling, already present in their experience, through this painting, but also this painting could inspire that feeling in those who didn't have it organically. And that was an incredibly important feeling in the 1920s. The feeling you just needed to slow down and focus on something, and even better if that something was a bit of nature. The feeling like you needed to pause the rest of the world so you could engage with something small, or pretend that the world doesn't exist for a moment. But the world does exist. O'Keeffe needed to live in it just like everybody else. If she really wanted this flower, painted at scale, to be seen, to be the subject of focused attention, to, as she said, not be ignored, then it needed an audience. She said, When you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for the moment. I wanted to give that world to someone else. She wants to give that experience to somebody else, and for that, she would need publicity. She would need to engage with the world. In order to share, there needs to be an audience. Her husband, the photographer and art critic Arthur Stieglitz, knew how to get that. She obviously didn't like this side of the art world, but it's one that she ultimately accepted. I don't like publicity. It embarrasses me, she said. But as most people buy pictures through their ears and their eyes, one must be written about and talked about, or the people who buy through their ears think your work is no good and won't buy, and one must sell to live, so one must be written about and talked about whether one likes it or not. It always seems they say such stupid things. Those stupid things were sometimes male interpretations of the feminine as dainty and pure and innocent. The 19th century historian Jules Michelet, for example, claimed that the woman's entire education could be had exclusively through the study of a flower. He wrote, 
For woman, a flower is a whole, whole, pure, innocent, peacemaking. They speak so low, these flowers, that we can hardly hear them. They are the Earth's silent children. So yeah, art critics sometimes viewed O'Keefe as a woman studying a flower in her painting and learning lessons about purity or whatever. On the other end of this insanity, you have the Freudians, who, instead of seeing pure innocence in a flower, saw distilled sexuality. Remember, this is the early 20th century. Freud was huge. One critic, Lewis Mumford, wrote a review of one of O'Keefe's shows. The show is strong. One loud, loud blast of sex. Sex in youth. Sex in adolescence. Sex in maturity. So what O'Keefe saw as a moment of reflection in a busy world, the critics saw as either purity, that is, the absence of sex, or sex outright. The flowers became an image male critics could project their own associations of gender onto. This kind of pissed her off, as you could imagine, and she responded, When you took the time to really notice my flower, you hung all your associations with flowers on my flower, and you write about my flower as if I think and see what you think and see of the flower, and I don't. In fact, the Mumford review I quoted above ended with the disclaimer, after this description, you'd better not visit the show. Inevitably, you'll be a little disappointed, for perhaps only half the sex is on the walls. The rest is probably in me. So at least he was a little self-aware there. This highlights an interesting question in the arts. One of the most valued aspects of art is its ability to communicate that which is difficult to communicate in words, specifically the communication of emotions. Which, if you want to learn more about, I tried to discuss in an earlier video about the expressive theory of art. The work of Georgia O'Keeffe is an example of an emotional, personal, and reflective message that was and continues to be interpreted as something completely different by its audience. She wished to share this vision of a flower with the world, and she got that wish, but with more exposure, the artist's intention became more obscured. Art inherently has an element of communication. It implies a social relationship between the artist and those who perceive the art. In the case of Georgia O'Keeffe, that relationship isn't always successful. There's noise in the system. The communication isn't clear. It's misread consistently. In that way, we can look at these flowers and say they failed. If the purpose was for O'Keefe to communicate a specific feeling or a specific idea, then they failed. But these paintings are not failures. They're attractive in the most literal sense of that word. She created something that could not be ignored. They're enchanting. When you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for the moment. She puts the viewer in a state of mind to be reflective. Remember, the act of looking has a two-way relationship with emotions. It doesn't just communicate the experience of the artist, it also reflects the experience of the viewer. And maybe that's why her work remains so popular. As you fall under the spell of these flowers, you'll see your own inner thoughts reflected back at you. Your world. In this trance, it won't be O'Keeffe's reflection, or her emotions, or her perspective. It will be your own. If you like this video, I hope I earned your subscription. I put out a new video about the middle of every month. Thank you so much for watching.